Thank you for tuning in to the best parenting show on the internet. Post Daily Dose. I hope you guys are doing fabulous this evening and welcome to the greatest little parenting show on the internet. Before we get started tonight with our topic, I wanted to plug these two books real quick. Brian's book, From Fear to Love, you can find on promotion at feartolovebook.com. And then this gem right here, The Great Behavior Breakdown, uh, you can find at thepostinstitute.com or on Amazon. And just so you know, um, Brian had one of the most incredible workbooks created for this book. Um, and it is being completed. I have it available as a digital download, but it's being completed in print on demand uh, via Amazon and should be available any day now. I'm anxiously checking my email every day to see if I've heard back from them with their approval. So I'll let you know as soon as we have it. So my topic tonight actually is sparked by um, a beautiful uh, exchange I had with one of our followers today. Um, and um, her story is kind of specific with regards to what I refer to as sneaky pee and sneaky poo. I did not originate that phrase. It actually comes from, I believe, Michael White, who is um, specializes in narrative therapy. And I believe he is from New Zealand. Um, I had a college professor, um, in my graduate studies who um, focused in that area of specialization and I got to do um, some specific, um, we had like a private training group that I got to be a part of, which was really an incredible opportunity for incredible growth as a graduate student. So, but let's talk a little bit about the more formal term in capricious and in euresis um, because it's really prevalent. And it's not something that very many people talk very much about because it's such a sensitive topic. But, you know, um, if we're lucky, if we're blessed, if we're healthy, we're all pooping and we're all peeing. So let's just talk about it um, and how we handle it. Let me just, I'm just going to jump right in and just, we're just going to jump right into this. So how we handle it and how we approach this topic, because it is sensitive, can really make a huge difference. And even in our processes of potty training, how we approach that makes a huge difference to the extent that one of the things I've realized is with older people, geriatric population, when they begin to have those issues reoccur in life because um, there's a lot of different things that can affect your ability to sense and to hold, to sense whether you need to pee or poop and to be able to hold your pee or poop until you're able to get to the toilet. And if there is trauma around that from early years, then as a geriatric person, it can cause that trauma to be re-triggered. And so this is such a fundamental piece of human, of humanity that I really... Uh, I'm just glad that we're going to talk about it. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is just our biology. So um, our ability, our urination and our defecation, that's all managed at the very base of the spine. That's where the nerve sensations that then can tell the brain um, that we need to pee, that we need to poo or to be able to hold it. All of that takes place at the very base of the spine. And so um, if there are issues around peeing and pooping or constipation or leaking, those are areas, neurological areas, that might need to be investigated. Um, if there's spinal cord injuries or there's even, it's called tethered cord. And so it's a form of spina bifida 
that is not seen by the visible eye. And so um, it could be, if there's an issue around peeing and pooping, it might be neurological. So that's always one area to look. Um, also, when we're talking about the bladder, there's this thing called neurogenic bladder, and a bladder can have spasms. And so when the bladder spasms, then it will produce urine. Um, and everybody's bladder holds different amounts. So if there's air, if there's issues around peeing, then that's also something to take a look at because we want to look at these sort of, I don't like to say it's a different kind of physical because even our emotionality is a physical thing. It's not, when people kind of say it's just in your head or when we talk about mental health issues, we talk about it as if it's not physical, but it is physical. Our brain is a physical thing and the things that take place in our brain are physical. So it's not just like a made up thing. It's like, why do we take things like the slice of your bladder and bladder spasms as if it's more serious than something that's emotional because it's all in the realm of the physical. So, you know, I always wanna look at these particular things, you know, those are things that are worth taking a look at. Oftentimes children, who have nighttime wetting may have um, a smaller capacity to hold that much urine or they may be very, very deep sleepers and in their state of sleep that they are not able to have that sense that other people do um, where they sense the need to pee and that need to pee actually wakes them up out of their sleep so they can go to the bathroom. So once we kind of get through that piece, um, then we're also looking at possibilities of trauma and that's the area that we work in right so when we're looking at trauma and we see issues with peeing and pooping then one thing we can pretty well guess and we're talking about if they're over oh let's say three or four um if they're over over the age of three or four or if you know that they have been potty trained but these accidents continue to happen then that lets us know that this is an issue oftentimes around something that's creating regression. Remember, when we stress, we regress. And that can even mean that we regress into areas that have to do with when we may have been potty trained. This mom in particular, um, the situation is it is a seasonal. So I'm guessing there's probably a trauma that happened for this little girl around this time of the year and she has consistently over the years that she's been in her adoptive home she's consistently regressed to a place where she is in uretic she's not holding her urine and peeing in the potty that she's more toddler and sometimes more infant and so the important thing is to meet the emotional needs that you see presented and to see this as an opportunity to create healing, to be able to speak into those wounds. Um, Brian, I think, does this so beautifully, and um, I'll share some other stories, but one of, the, one of the gifts that I think Brian brings to the arena of attachment, trauma, adoption, foster care, all of that, is this piece of speaking to the subconscious in a way that I don't know that I've ever heard anyone else ever even discuss. But to, excuse me, but to even bring this little child into your lap at a time that feels right, whatever that is, and lovingly be able to say, baby, I think something might have happened during this time of the year when you were really little before you were able to talk, so you may not have words for it, but the memories are still there in your body. And so that's why during this time of the year, you go back to not feeling like you're potty trained. And it's okay. I just want to let you know it's okay. That we're going to work it out. We're not going anywhere. I love you to pieces. And even, um, you know, in that situation, especially knowing that um, this is a seasonal um, I said, you know, get pull-ups, do whatever you need to do for her to be healthy and comfortable and loved through this, because it's through the comfort and love uh, of this child that she's going to be able to work through whatever that trauma is that's getting triggered. 
Um, I had another family that I worked with and their little girl was, she was about five, five if I'm remembering right at the time that I was working with them. And um, she'd been in the home for about six months. Um, there was obvious symptoms of neglect in that uh, um, it wasn't uncommon for her to drink water out of the toilet. It wasn't uncommon for her to eat food out of the trash. It wasn't uncommon for her to eat dog food out of the dog food bowl. And when everybody, they also had some babies in their home. And when it was nap time, which also meant mama's quiet time, the little girl, because she didn't want a nap, she would go up into her room and play quietly alone, which is perfectly acceptable, right? Um, and when she would go up there and play in her room alone, very often there would be incidents of pooping. And so she would poop in the play kitchen dishes and then she would hide it. So the first mission was to um, encourage her to let them know so that they wouldn't, it wouldn't be super smelly, that they would have the chance to help her clean it up. And so what became evident was that when she was up there playing by herself, it was possibly a reenactment for her of a time when she was literally left alone completely, no one in the house for an extended period of time. Also, <laughs> just that it, it was similar enough that it could trigger that, that toddler and infant type behavior. Excuse me, I've got <clears throat> a little something there. Um, and then the other piece is just Oftentimes in that space, what you'll see if you walk in, if you were to walk in in that moment, is a lot of disassociation. So when trauma has occurred, it is not, we talk about fight, flight, and freeze and fawn from that place in the amygdala that gets triggered. And oftentimes when we say freeze, what's actually happening is a disassociated state. And so when trauma has occurred, our brains do amazing things to help protect. So it's like that it like it kind of segments these things off. It compartmentalizes. That's why sometimes memories are not clear. And yet there's this sense of something happening that it can be blocked off because the brain will do that through self-protection. And during trauma, while trauma is occurring, Oftentimes, people will disassociate. They'll have like an out-of-body experience. It is our brain's attempt to keep us safe at an emotional and mental level through these very horrific things that no child should ever endure. No human should ever endure. And our brains have these amazing capacities to somehow keep us preserved through these horrific, horrific situations. Um, I've had... Situations in our group home where we had teenage boys who had issues with um, enuresis, especially at night. And what we found to be the most helpful is when we can find the avenue for their comfort and soothing, when we can find the end. So uh, we had great staff who came across things that this one particular young man I'm thinking of, um, and he was very tactile. And so we found one of those blankets that had the satin strip across the top, and he loved that. He loved it. So, you know, he's 16 years old and has been in treatment centers most of his life and has lots of emotional developmental delays because in treatment centers, we just get older. We don't necessarily get raised. There's not a lot of emotional maturation that happens because emotions are permitted they're just not permitted. If you have an outburst in a treatment center, you get restrained and your medications get get upped. There's not anybody really walking it through with you. And so um, he used pull-ups at night. And uh, once we had this, once we came across this one soothing mechanism, literally within a week, he came to me and said, I don't need these pull-ups anymore. Maybe somebody else can use them. So the moral of the story is, well, let me tell you one more story because this is such a good one. Um, this comes from Brian's book, From Fear to Love, and I'm trying to see if I can find what chapter because it's, oh, here it is. Um, this is like in the second chapter and it's around page 14. He's talking about an exchange he had with the person who came to one of his trainings and the mom comes up during one of the breaks and talks about her son 
who almost every time they have a transition, almost every time they're getting ready to leave the house, he poops his pants. And the mom said, you know, I had a therapist say, it's like he's saying shit on you or like he's marking his territory, like so off base in terms of understanding what's going on at the brain level. So remember I told you guys the other night, we were talking about things that you can do that can help create some health in your central nervous system. So we have this nerve in the back that starts in the base of our brain, which is right next to our brain stem, which is right where our trauma memories are stored, right? It is called the vagus nerve. I call it the Las Vegas nerve because it helps me remember. So the Las Vegas nerve travels from the base of your brain and it goes all the way down your core through your gut and to your rectum. So when you have a massive issue, trauma issue that is uh, attached with transition, the vagus nerve will get activated, pop, and it will send information straight to your gut, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And if you didn't know this, it is not uncommon when people are in a state of terror that they will pee or poop themselves. That is a real thing that happens because of the vagus nerve. So it's like, um, I think it's probably, honestly, it probably comes out of, um, oh, I just lost the word like evolutionary psychology, that you, if you void, then you have a better chance of surviving, getting loose, getting free. You can distract your prey. <laughs> so I'm just guessing. I'm, I'm going to research that. I'll get back to you. And so that's a real thing. And so Brian was trying to, he slammed, this has really happened. He slammed the table with this woman. He explained, look, he's just, this has to do with transition. This has to do with his fight, flight, and freeze mechanism. This is coming from a place of stress and fear. And he, she said, you mean to tell me he can't control this? He can't control the fact that he needs to poop because it's like a startle response. So he slams the table and the woman jumps, of course. And he said, yes, just like that. Control that. Don't jump. Don't jump when you're startled. And then they continue to converse a little bit. And he, out of nowhere, slams the table again. And she gets startled again. And he said, see, you can't control it. Until you are really aware. Until you create a lot of calm. Until you create a lot of soothing at the brain level. So for this young man, you know, the idea would be to, to come and say, son, I don't know what it is that may have happened, or, or, or if you do know. I mean, if this is a child who comes from the foster care system, that is, you think about massive transition to be taken from what you know, even if it's an abusive or neglectful situation, to be removed from that situation and not know where you're going or who you're going to, that can be pretty traumatic. That's a pretty traumatic transition of just one that many of those kids go through. But to be able to just speak to that lovingly and say, "Hun, and I know that when, when we're getting ready to leave, it really gets your brain activated. And the activation of your brain causes you, it sends a signal down to your belly, down to your gut. And it causes you to poop right when we're getting ready to leave. So we're going to work on it. You know, we'll try some things. I'll try letting you know 10 minutes before we're leaving. Maybe that'll help you get prepared and have you get a chance to, you know, have your brain be activated and have a chance to poop before we go. Or we'll just keep an extra set of clothes in the car because it's likely to happen. But it's, gonna, it's not going to happen forever. We're going to figure this out and we're going to work through it. Don't worry, baby. I love you. As opposed to thinking that children are just doing these things on purpose. We do such damage by assigning these negative intentions to people's behavior. If you cannot see inside their heart, then do not assign a negative intention. Assume that they are doing the best they can with where they're at. So with the mom that I spoke with today, we talked about speaking to that subconscious place. We also talked about this as being a beautiful opportunity to help create comfort and soothing around whatever it is that happened because clearly she's regressed to a younger state um, that it's okay um, if if bottle feeding feels like the thing to do then bottle feed 
duplicate. Duplicate what we do with babies. Get that oxytocin flowing. Use that eye contact. Bottle feeding is an amazing activity to activate oxytocin and create that um, the bonding and attachment that we need in the parent-child relationship. But of all things, of all things, just understand that they are doing the best that they can. And when we can meet them wherever they are at in their emotional age, and we can provide love and support and nurturing and guidance through it, we're going to make our way to the other side. So I hope there's something in that that's helpful. I hope that uh, somebody gets a little tip that might help them with something they may be struggling with. I've got lots more stories around that, but I think that's plenty for tonight. I hope that tonight you have a chance to set anything you might be worried or concerned about aside. Set those tasks aside. They're going to get done. All the stuff you think needs to get done, it'll get done. But make sure you spend some time with your children. Just loving on them. Playing with them. Belly blowing. Snuggling. Laughing. Playing a game. Watching some TV. Snuggling. Relaxing. Whatever it is that your family does. Trust what you know about your children and spend time in a way that lets your love for them shine through. And remember what Brian tells us, that in any given moment, we can act out of our same blueprints of stress and fear and anger. is at 6.30 Central Time on Facebook at the Post Institute. Don't forget to get your copy of Brian's best-selling book, From Fear to Love, on promotion. Just pay shipping and handling at www.feartolovebook.com. That's www.feartolovebook.com.